I think in March. I don't think. I mean, you might want to do a process today. Okay. give you his number? Whatever works for you. I mean, I can do that or if you want to just text him. Uh, I can text you. I can text him whatever works. Well, there's his number. Oh, there's his number. Alright. 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 He's, he's I think we're good. How you doing? I'm doing well. How about you? Pretty good. Hi, Jim Marie. How are you? All right. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Good to see you. That's good. All right. Yeah. Well, again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get this sent over to you, and you can spread it out wherever you want. I think you're gonna have a pretty good attendance today. Yeah, I think based on uh, you. Uh, you know, you know, right now. Right. Yeah. And I would only mention to you too. I know you probably get them for forty at least. But given these out as uh, evaluations, not to evaluate you, but to get input from you. Oh, yeah. other ideas and the, the, the room, the
said that one only to my son. Is it your special table? Oh, I just need to be the only one who's doing it. I didn't try it. You're good? I got a new pen. I used to go to this flat room. Andrew, can't lose this guy. I have a fire stick. Friends can't lose. It's going to be the best weekend in football. Because they have a guy. I have a watch for that. You're smart. <laughs> 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 I was a little impressed with them last Sunday. They haven't quit or anything, you know? I would have thought at this point it would just be. Yeah, mainly the pay us. Yeah, we might be late, so I'm going to say that. In some way, they're going to screw it up. They're going to win a game. I know. From what I see, they project to just draft us. Yeah. I don't think so. I don't know. He's not a 3 4 defense. He's not a 3 3. How are you doing? Which one is the rush line? 100%. What do I get? We've been so down there. You know what? I'm going to give you the Gold Star Award, which I'll give you the next time. What's the name? I think, yeah, I think you're the only one. You're the only one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Are you the one? And they wouldn't be using that as a shot. I know you're not. You probably never made it.
But it's, 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 I have the two it's completely separate. It's a, it's a separate, it's $35 a month for the $60 package for so it's kind of a lot of different options. I was looking at it today. I was hoping, let me know if you do a second.
the tenth son of Josiah Franklin, a candlestick and soap maker. At the age of 15, Franklin is apprenticed to his brother James in the printing business. Here at this early age, we get a glimpse of his creativity when he um, introduces to his brother through letters that are secretly slipped under the shop door at night, um, Silence Do Good. Silence Do Good, according to her letters, um, is a widow who is successfully running the family business. And in her letters to, we might say, to James or to the editor, uh, she explains that, in her opinion, women could be every bit as successful as men when it came to becoming lawyers or being doctors or even preachers there in Boston. Now, you can imagine that when these, these uh, stories about silence do good get printed, the Puritan leaders of Boston are outraged. This just is not the way women are expected to, um, uh, to behave. They're not to assert themselves at this point in history. And so they demand that James reveal who she is. Well, he spends uh, several nights in his shop waiting for that letter to be slipped under the door. And when he finally sees it come under the door, he pulls the door open quickly, and there stands his younger brother. And um, the story is that he roughed his brother up pretty good as a result of all that happens at this point. Franklin leaves um, uh, Boston and goes off to Philadelphia. There in Philadelphia in 1723, he apprentices himself to a printer for a short time. Uh, he soon finds himself in a position where he can start his own business and he'll be recognized for his very high quality work. Somewhere at this time, in 1728, we know that Franklin fathered an illegitimate child named William. We're not sure who the mother may have been. Two years later, Franklin takes up with Deborah Reed, whose husband had abandoned her. Because the husband isn't around, there's no possibility of a legal divorce. And so uh, Franklin uh, takes up with Deborah in a, in a, common, a common law uh, marriage. Uh, it's an arrangement that will last for the rest of Deborah's life. He will outlive her, of course, by many years. And in those early years of their marriage, they're quite a team. Uh, they work very hard together. He runs his print shop. She has an adjoining shop right next door, which is a general store. And then in, behind those two shops, Franklin has um, a bookstore. It's very common for printers at that time to be publishers and book binders so that they could supplement their incomes. As a result of this bookstore that he begins, he will end up with 4,000 books, of which I'm going to talk about some more in, in just a few minutes. In 1729, Franklin purchases the Pennsylvania Gazette, which became one of the most popular newspapers in all the colonies. It was in this newspaper that Franklin introduces the first editorial section in American history, a section that he enjoys very much because it gives him the opportunity to print his opinions concerning politics and a wide range of other issues throughout the colonies. It's also at this time that he helps found an organization known as the Junto. This could be uh, called America's first service club. It's something uh, on the same level as what we know today with the Kiwanis Club and the Rotary and uh, the Lions Club. In this case, the Junto was set up so that young entrepreneurs and craftsmen like Franklin could network out among others throughout Philadelphia and the surrounding region. And uh, it proved to be very, very successful. It's at this time with his friends in the Junto and many others that he comes into contact with that Franklin begins to espouse a novel idea he has that uh, we now call daylight savings time. He thought that by instituting daylight savings time, shops could stay open uh, a little longer in the winter without having to burn the extra candles. 
1733, Ben Franklin, then 27 years old, begins Poor Richard's Almanac. This almanac is going to be published annually for the next 26 years, and it will be the most popular of all the almanacs throughout the colonies. He is going to sell 10,000 copies of these every year, and they are loaded with his wit and his humor. To um, give you an example, a further example of his imagination and his creativity, he invents this character named Richard Saunders. Saunders is the front man for this, this almanac. Um, this is an imaginary character, again, who allegedly uh, needs money to care for his sick wife. Uh, there's a story that goes on and on in sequels about them. Uh, most of the stories are very humorous as, as uh, Saunders interacts with his wife and, you know, she uh, responds to his remarks and so on. Um, the magic of this fictional character is this. In the almanac, Franklin predicts the weather. That's one of the reasons why people uh, buy the almanacs. And so if a person came up to Franklin and said, hey, Franklin, what's going on? This is supposed to be a mild winter. Look at this. We get snowstorms. Or it's not supposed to rain this week. Look what's happening. We get storms. And Franklin would say, hey, it's not my fault. you got to check with Saunders. He's the one who did it. I'm only the printer. Isn't that incredible? And people believe that. They believe it. Some of his many quotes, examples of his wit that are found in these almanacs. A penny saved is a penny earned. Ever hear that? Oh, you've heard a lot of these. Um, he that burns logs that cost nothing is twice warmed. Or how about this? There are no gains without pains. Love your neighbor, but don't tear down the hedge. This, we've all heard, God helps those who help themselves. <coughs> and finally, nothing is certain but death and taxes. In 1736, Franklin was appointed clerk of the Pennsylvania General Assembly. And this is because um, before this point, he had been retained as the official printer of the assembly to print all their documents, uh, their letterhead, even the uh, paper money that was used in the colony of Pennsylvania at that time. As the members of the assembly got to know him and trust him more, he was appointed clerk. And soon after that, he will find himself appointed postmaster of the city of Philadelphia. By this time, he had also established the Union Fire Company, which is the first fire department in Philadelphia. And um, there is a little catch to this. You would not receive the benefit of fire protection if your house caught fire from this fire department unless you bought into it with a membership. Um, he would... Um, uh, uh, advertised the memberships with this quote, not only in his almanac, but other printings. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Throughout the 1730s and 1740s at this time in his life, Franklin uh, comes up with a novel idea, and that is the franchise. The first franchises in America came from Ben Franklin. And here's what he did. This, this man had more work than he could handle. At any one time, he had between four and a half dozen apprentices working for him. And they were well trained. He wouldn't have taken them on if they didn't have the uh, potential. Once he felt that they were masters of the trade, he set them up in business. He bought their printing equipment, he bought their paper, their ink, the presses, whatever it took. The catch is, first, they could not set up business in Philadelphia. As a matter of fact, he didn't even want them in Pennsylvania. And so you have these pre apprentices that he put out as masters, setting up their shops in places like South Carolina, Virginia, Georgia, 
And uh, it's, it's remarkable how many of these, these businesses that uh, he has uh, set up that will flourish. And also in return, these new printers are allowed to put on their shingle that they had apprenticed under the great printer, Ben Franklin. In return, they had to pay Franklin one third of their profits annually for the next six years. So as he's continually over 20 year period, sending out or putting out these masters in printing who are paying him one third of their profits from all over the colonies, can you imagine what his revenue flow is? It's incredible. As a matter of fact, he finds himself so financially secure that by 1749, he is able to completely retire from the printing business. He retires so that he can concentrate on his interest in science and on the many inventions that have been rolling through his mind. Inventions such as the Franklin stove. Um, he invents, this is a person who also enjoyed the outdoors. Uh, he invents what we now know as windsurfing. He invented this contraption, if you could picture it in your mind's eye. It's a big chair with pedals. And when you move the pedals with your feet through a series of uh, gears and chains, like on a bicycle, it moved a fan that was attached overhead to the chair so that you could keep cool in the summer and it kept the flies away. How about that? Probably his most famous invention is the lightning rod. At that time, before the invention of the lightning rod, we, we can only imagine the numbers of barns and homes and buildings and even ships that were destroyed by strikes of lightning. With the uh, invention of the lightning rod, the charge from a lightning bolt is grounded and thus uh, people's homes and other buildings and ships are saved. Uh, I want to give you an idea of, of how deeply he gets into this and how dangerous it could be, how dangerous it was. In his autobiography, he discusses the fact that he extended a nine-foot lightning rod above his chimney. It was, uh, from that lightning rod, wires were attached um, that ran through his roof through a glass tube so he wouldn't catch his roof on fire. Once they um, entered the house, once it entered the house, the wire was extended down to the stairwell just in front of his bedroom. And then it was, it was separated into two strands. The strands were about six inches apart, and he had a little bell attached to each end. Between the bells was a silk uh, thread or ribbon from which he suspended a brass ball. At night, during the thunderstorm, he could lay there in bed and listen to the bells ring. How about that? One night, a very powerful storm swept through the area, and he hears these sharp crackling sounds that he hadn't heard before, and so he jumps out of bed opens the bedroom door, walks out onto the, the, the balcony there uh, in front of his bedroom and peers into the stairwell and studies what he sees. And here's what he described in his own words. I perceived that the brass ball, instead of vibrating as usual between the bells, was repelled and kept at a distance from the bells while the fire passed, sometimes in very large, quick cracks from bell to bell, and sometimes in a continued dense white stream, seemingly as large as my finger, whereby the whole staircase was enlightened as with sunshine so that one might see to pick up a pin. Can you imagine that? You and I would be running for a bucket of water to put out the fire. And here's this man, ever the scientist, standing there at the balcony in front of his bedroom, Peering there into the staircase, taking mental notes and studying it. That's amazing. He also um, experimented with uh, the reaction.
attraction animals might have to jolts of electricity from lightning bolts. And he came up uh, with these notes. This is his deduction. He deduced that, that um, mentally, the mentally insane who are in asylums might benefit from shock treatments because he noticed the calming effect it had on hyperactive dogs and even on turkeys. How about that? In another instance, he wanted to experiment to see if enough, how much electricity it would take to cook a turkey. And so he sets up for the experiment with a coming storm. He's got his son William with him and another friend. And they witness this near fatal event as electricity flashes through the line just as Franklin accidentally touched the wire that was attached to the turkey. As a result, he's thrown across the room and is rendered unconscious for nearly a minute. As he regains consciousness in his friend's arms, he whispers, instead of a dead turkey, it was almost a cooked goose. Somehow he still manages to find his humor in this. In 1751, Franklin and his colleagues in the Junto raised uh, several thousand pounds. Uh, that's British, uh, the British monetary system. Um, and had convinced the Assembly of Pennsylvania to match those funds so that they could construct the Pennsylvania Hospital there in 1751. Take a good look at that drawing. This is the Pennsylvania Hospital today, still in operation. In 1752, the Philadelphia contribution for insurance against loss of fire was uh, begun by Franklin. This is the first fire insurance company in Pennsylvania, I'm sorry, in Philadelphia. And um, the headquarters had been in this very building you see in the photograph. Now, I want to get back to his library of 4,000 books. With those books, in 1731, Franklin began the first circulating library in North America. He also invented, so that he could reach these books on shelves that were being built higher and higher as more books are added, uh, he invents the artificial arm for retrieving books from those shelves. He also invented the library chair, which you see here in this photograph. This library chair extends out into a uh, step ladder so that you could step up and reach for books higher on shelves. He invented the Philadelphia busybody. That's his term for it. He could sit in the easy chair of his house up on the second floor. Looking at the mirror outside his window, he could see the face of the person who was knocking on his front door. He invented um, the bifocals. Well, this happened when he was in France. He had two sets of glasses. One was for reading, close up, and the other he would have to switch to see further ahead and see across the room, see who was there. And this bothered him quite a bit because he kept having to switch glasses or lose the set. And so he goes to a person who made eyeglasses there. And um, together with Franklin's direction, they took the lens of both glasses, the lenses of both glasses, and cut them in half, left to right. And then he took the lenses that he used to read with and had them inserted into the frames on the bottom part. And he had the lenses that he saw further away with inserted on the top parts. And we have the world's first bifocals. Isn't that incredible? Now, um, for those of you who are my students in here, uh, you can't really appreciate the benefit of these bifocals. But perhaps someday in your late 50s, when you get into your 60s, you'll, you'll know how important this is. You'll be able to relate to me on this. He also becomes very interested in this at this time. And perhaps he always had the interest, but it comes out more now in his writings at this stage of his life. Physical fitness, how about that? And cardiovascular issues. And one's diet. 
and um, the way people were cared for in hospital wards. And he surmises by studying all these different things that first of all, among the many other uh, decisions he makes, that if you have people who are in a sick room, he thought it was more beneficial to open the windows and let the warm air and the sunshine in because people were confined in a, in a, in a room with the windows shut, only share their sickness together. And it goes on and on. Um, he believed that the best cure for people who had common colds or the flu was a lot of liquids and plenty of sleep. How about that? This guy's ahead of his time. In studying uh, cardiovascular issues, yeah, this man studied people a great deal. He studied their diets. He studied uh, the activities they were involved with. And he himself writes this in his notes. By the use of the dumbbell, he's lifting weights every day. I have, in 40 swings, quickened my pulse from 60 to 100 beats a minute, counted by a stopwatch. And so, um, studying diet, he comes up with some other sayings. To lengthen thy life, lessen thy meals. Eat to live, not live to eat. How about this one? Many dishes, many diseases. You know, I should pay more attention to this. Um, he doesn't know why, he could never prove it. But he believed that people who ate a lot of red meat People who ate a lot of fatty foods for some reason didn't live as long as people who ate uh, a different type of diet. He urged his friends and others through his writings, therefore, to eat more fish and more fowl, but not duck, because duck, he said, is too fatty, and for some reason people eat a lot of duck. They don't live long either. He goes on to write further in his notes, I walk a league, that's quite a distance, I walk a league every day in my chamber. I walk quick and for an hour so that I go a league. I make a point of religion about it. Um, he urged his friends and readers to eat plenty of vegetables, citrus fruits whenever possible. His favorite fruit for health was the apple. Thus he comes up with the term an apple a day keeps the doctor away. He also believed that probably the best exercise for the human body was swimming. He swam all of his life. Um, he gave swimming lessons when he lived in Philadelphia as a younger man. He's the man who invented swimming fins. Uh, at the age of 80, he's 80 years old in Paris. He swims across the Seine River. People couldn't believe it. He also studied the effects of air pollution on one's respiratory system. Um, he noticed that in the wintertime, especially when people are burning wood and coal in their fireplaces and the air is full of soot and smoke, people began to wheeze and cough a great deal more than they did in the summertime when the air wasn't so full of smoke. And so he's telling people, you know what? All this smoke in the air is not good for us. He even goes to the extent of inventing a better lighting system for the streets of Philadelphia. We know that his political career probably began as the official printer for the Assembly of Pennsylvania. He also had become the official printer for the colonies of Delaware, Maryland, and New Jersey. He's very popular. Um, he goes on to be named, because of his activities in, with these other assemblies, Postmaster General of North America. And in that position, he began to map possible postal routes throughout all the colonies so that the mail could travel more quickly. Again, a man ahead of his time, he appoints a postmistress in Boston. Thus, he has appointed the first female in America to hold a public office. This is a man who always believed, remember Silas Duga, that women were just as equal as men when it came to confidence in so many fields. In 1754, because of Indian attacks on frontier towns throughout the colonies, Franklin realized the need for a system of defense. 
a system whereby we could call up a militia to, um, to, to protect our, our colonists. Um, to, to arrive at this point, he came up with the idea of what he called the plan of union, whereby the colonies would band together, they would join together under one leader, they would contribute money that would be raised from a one, the equivalent of a one penny tax on hard liquors. And um, they would raise their militia in this fashion. But to do so, he had to convince the proprietors of Pennsylvania, the Penn family who lived in England, and he had to convince the crown the uh, British King and Parliament, because both entities were very nervous about this. The last thing they wanted was a, a military. They didn't know how powerful it might grow within their colonies or uh, with the, the pen. The pens don't forget they're also Quakers, pacifists. Uh, they didn't know how far this would this would end up in Pennsylvania, and so. Franklin is going to be sent by the colonies in 1757 to convince the Pens and the Crown um, to, the, uh, to accept this uh, notion of a plan of union. Here he is, 51 years old, going to Britain to convince some mighty powerful entities of the need for this defense system. This is a man who uh, has great achievements behind him as an inventor, as a printer, um, as a philosopher, and he's got great achievements ahead of him, even greater achievements. Do you know he's gonna be 70 years old when he signs the Declaration of Independence? He's gonna be 81 years old when he and other founding fathers adopt the Constitution of the United States. To put this more in, in more perspective here, in 1757, as he's sailing across the Atlantic Ocean to meet with officials in the highest levels of the British government, George Washington was 25 years old. Thomas Jefferson, future president of the United States, was 14 years old. James Madison, another future president of the United States, was six. Alexander Hamilton, our nation's first Secretary of the Treasury was six months old. This man, as you see on this screen, has another lifetime ahead of him. Of course, he is resisted by the Penn family as well as the Crown and Nita's Parliament. It is about this time that Franklin comes up with this diagram that appears in his newspaper in uh, other uh, printings throughout the colonies. Um, it's a rattlesnake that's cut up into sections, representing either sections of, our, uh, of the colonies or colonies themselves, with a statement underneath, join or die. That's, that's part of his unity uh, uh, issue. This same diagram will become a symbol on the eve of and during the American Revolution. But at this point, it's important to realize Franklin isn't ready to sever ties with Britain. He believes very strongly that uh, this is all simply part of a disagreement, that there's not really a problem here, that uh, it, with a little bit more conversation, he can convince the Parliament and the Crown that uh, America needs to form its own uh, defense system against the Indians. When the French and Indian War comes and the British troops arrive to protect the colonies from the French and from the Indian allies of the French, um, Franklin takes part by contributing from his own um, uh, personal funds money to finance General Braddock's campaign his ill-fated campaign through the wilderness um, in an effort to drive the French from Fort Duquesne, the location of present-day uh, Pittsburgh. Afterwards, the British decide that because they're so deeply in debt, the American colonists should help pay for the debt they incurred in fighting that war in North America. And that's why they first passed the Stamp Act, and when that occurs, the colonies rise up in protest because they had, of course, 
uh, no role in um, in deciding how this this tax would be implemented or uh, who would who would be taxed by it. So again, they send Franklin to London, and uh, he's he's successful in in helping the uh, the British uh, realize that they need to repeal this. Uh, he'll return again in 1770 when the British uh, uh, level the uh, Townshend Acts against us, so other types of taxes. Now, when he's over there in Britain, Franklin makes it a point to approach uh, authors, uh, popular people who have written letters, um, folks who might do him a favor and contact their own members of parliament or even the crown if they're associated with the king. One of those he approaches is Edward Gibbon, the great British historian who has just finished The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, a great uh, historical work concerning that time period. Gibbon refuses to answer the door, shouting through the door to Franklin, I decline to associate with anyone who would dishonor my king. Franklin responds quickly, that's a pity, because you'll soon be writing a sequel the decline and fall of the British Empire. At one banquet that Franklin attended, an English countess confronts him. Now, it's well known in those those political circles that this countess was in a terrible marriage in which she was severely abused. As she sort of flirts with uh, Franklin and then chides him, she asks, Dr. Franklin, why are you such a rebel? He replies, ma'am, it is tyranny that causes rebellion, and wives like you should be the first to recognize the chains of tyranny. And really, that's what it was all about in his mind, tyranny. Um, It's probably what is known as the cockpit trial in 1774 that finally convinces Franklin that reconciliation with England is futile. An individual, high-ranking person in um, the highest circles of uh, the British government, very closely associated with King George himself, accuses Franklin of political intrigue. He has him brought before Parliament, where he is uh, brought before the cockpit, and Wedderburn promptly attacks him. Franklin, knowing that if he responds the wrong way, can be put in prison, he might even be put in the tower, stands there and takes it with, um, with no response whatsoever. And Wedderburn, increasingly frustrated over this very long um, attack on Franklin, finally shouts, Franklin, you are less than a traitor. You are just a common fornicator and a thief. Later, after everything breaks up, Franklin finds Wedderburn in the corridors of Parliament and uh, touches him by the elbow and says, Wedderburn, anyone who strikes a man who can't strike back is less than a man. And when America does strike back, you will find that you will be serving a lesser king who has dominion over a lesser empire. And that really is it for Franklin. Um, He becomes now a strong supporter of breaking away from England. So he's going to return to America in 1775, only a few months after the death of his wife, Deborah. Um, You know, it's at this point I, I, I need to say this about Franklin to show, you know, all the sides of him. As great a man as he was in almost every endeavor he undertook, I always um, felt badly over the way he treated Deborah. Um, She begged him many, many times to come home. She wasn't well. She was suffering, by this point, a series of strokes. Um, She missed him. She would never join him because she had a terrible fear of uh, crossing the Atlantic. Um, she is a woman who was more of a homebody. Um, she probably wasn't exciting, as exciting to him as other women he met in uh, France later on in, in Britain at this point. Um, she 
uh, may have been more matronly at this point as their marriage goes on. There were long, long um, periods of time when Deborah wouldn't receive a letter at all. She'd beg him, you know, please tell me how you're doing. What's, what's happening? And he ignores her. Um, one of his final letters to her, I think it was just awful. It's shortly before her death, and she's explaining that she's having trouble keeping the books. You know, the books have been a lot to him. That's his financial base. And he's, he's got quite a sum of money that he's accumulated in his lifetime. He wants it taken care of, and he expects her to do it. And she's telling him in these letters how difficult it is, increasingly difficult. And uh, he strikes back at her with these remarks that were, I think you're so unfair and hurtful. And um, she passes away from the final stroke. And when he returns home, it's almost like, you know, well, okay, it happened. And he moves on very quickly. Of course, you know, a series of events sweep him along. And I think it's fair to say that that's one of the reasons that he didn't really have time to mourn. Um, he's going to be very quickly, as he arrives in America, elected to the Continental Congress. Uh, from this position, he's going to play a strong role in swinging Pennsylvania to the Patriot cause. One of his favorite remarks that he gives to uh, the delegates there from Pennsylvania is, make yourselves sheep and the wolves will eat you. He's telling them, you have to get involved with the break from England. This is another one of his um, phrases. Any society that would give up a little liberty to gain a little security will deserve neither and lose both. He even turns to his son, William, who he's loved and doted over all of his life. He's even instrumental in uh, getting William appointed governor of New Jersey. He tells him at this point, William, it's time for us to sever our relations with Britain. And he wanted William, of course, to resign his position as governor. And William won't. William is a stalwart, pro-British official here in America. And he and Franklin get in a terrible argument in front of witnesses. And at that point, Franklin says to him very sternly, Billy, if you choose the king as your master, you may lose me as a father. And sure enough, um, the governor of New Jersey will not resign. Instead, he's going to find himself arrested and imprisoned for a couple of years. He will be released, perhaps because of his father's influence, we're not sure. He'll sail to England never to return, and the relationship between the father and the son is formally destroyed. In 1775, the Continental Congress appoints Franklin Postmaster General of the United States. In July 1776, he becomes one of the authors of the uh, Declaration of Independence. And then he is sent to France because we needed an ally to help us against the most powerful country in the world. Nobody had a navy like the British. The British Redcoats, along with their allies from the German kingdoms, uh, are forced to be reckoned with. And so we needed help. We needed help from France. And Benjamin Franklin is sent there as the envoy from the United States. He is a hit. He is sensational. The people rave over him. Uh, he knows that many Frenchmen and French women have a uh, stereotype concerning Americans that you know we uh, that uh, the people here were wearing buckskin clothing and coonskin caps, and so as a joke, this guy is a real prankster. I haven't told you that yet. Uh, he loved good jokes, and uh, he, as a joke, he puts on this uh, coonskin cap with his suit and starts walking through the streets of Paris, and people loved it. Uh, he even poses for a portrait painter, and this is the result. Um, to give you an idea of the pranks that he could pull and how quick he was, at a Paris banquet in the home of a marquis, they were eating with golden utensils. How about that? How many of you 
have forks and spoons and knives at home made of solid gold. There's Franklin at a table where they are using this. And suddenly he sees from the corner of his eye one of the guests steal a fork and put it in his trouser pocket. He didn't say anything. But later on, after the dinner, this um, casual conversation occurs with all the guests, and of course they're asking Franklin a million questions about America and about his inventions. And one person asked him, what is it in your mind that causes you to think of these inventions? And he said, well, modestly, he says, it's really um, uh, a matter of mind over matter. And he said, mind over matter? He said, oh, yes, I can make things happen just by imagining it. They said, really? He said, sure, let me show you. And he holds up this golden fork. And he said, now, I want everybody here at the table to concentrate as hard as they could on this fork. And they were all staring at the fork. And he said, all right, now I want you to close your eyes for a moment. And don't open them until I tell you to. So they close their eyes. He lets the fork drop into the sleeve of his suit jacket. And he said, okay, open your eyes. And then you look at him and the fork's gone. And then he says, as though he's speaking to the fork, let it move to, and he points to this guy who stole the fork originally, let it move to your trousers pocket. And he tells the guy to stand up and he goes over there and he lifts the fork out of this guy's pocket and everybody went nuts. They were believers. Do you believe that? There are only two people in the room who knew that Franklin was full of beans. One is Franklin, and the other is the guy who stole the fork, and he's not talking. It's remarkable. Um, while in France, he attended many salons. These are uh, usually um, groups of women who gather, and they'll discuss whatever they talked about at that time. They have tea, and they have you know, uh, uh, refreshments and pastries, and sometimes it gets more formal than that. Um, and, and Franklin was invited to attend, and he did. Now, you have to understand, at this period of time, women in the royal circles of France, and, and probably all the other countries where they had kings and queens, were expected to look pretty, to dress elegantly, and to be quiet. <coughs> Um, their opinions in public anyway were not to be um, uh, stated. Well, here's Franklin. He comes to their salons and he wants to know all about them. He wants to know, you know, how they, what their recipes were for the whatever it is that he's eating. And uh, they want to know about America. And he tells them all these great stories about America and what it was like in London and uh, the inventions and he compliments them. He compliments them on the way they look. He compliments them on the way they dress. These are a lot of things they don't often hear from their own husbands or others in society. He wants to know their opinions, and he tells them how intelligent they are. They certainly don't ever hear that. And um, they come really to revere him more than ever. Yeah, he shares his own recipes from America with them. So we have this conversation that goes on back and forth. Uh, this is a woman who always admired women. He respected them. He respected what they had to say. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to try and say this with respect. He loved women. He loved the company of women. Um, he could find great conversation with them, as he could with, with most men that he encountered. He treats them equally, and he believed that women should, should be able to do more. And he told them this, and it's it was like a breath of fresh air. Um, uh, needless to say, I think they would go home and you could imagine the conversation with their husbands as uh, they explained to him that Franklin had told them uh, how, how badly they need French help, that the colonists are being defeated by the British only because they don't have that help from the French. And so um, he's very effective not only with working with the uh, men in the royal circles of Paris, but uh, uh, in discussions with their wives as well. He goes on to be very quick-witted. 
uh, no matter who it is, uh, at a royal banquet held in his honor as the man who sees lightning from the heavens, young and beautiful queen Marie Antoinette begins to sort of flirt with him. And uh, as she's batting her eyelashes, she says, Dr. Franklin, aren't you aware of the fate of Prometheus, who was tortured to death for the crime of stealing the fire from Jove? Franklin quickly responds, if creating sparks is a crime, your eyes cause more mischief in a night than all of my experiments of a lifetime. What a compliment. In 1778, America secured that very badly needed treaty with France. And Franklin, among a handful of others who were with him from America, could be thanked for that. In 1779, Franklin returns to America and is promptly elected governor of Pennsylvania. He is also the most powerful supporter of Washington and the Continental Army. In 1781, he'll be sent back to Paris, where a year later he takes part in signing the Treaty of Paris, which ends the American Revolution. It's there that he witnesses hot air balloons in flight, and he begins to imagine in his writings what it's going to lead to in the future. He imagines that people with air travel are going to be able to go from one destination to another. Perhaps even whole armies will be landed in, in far away regions through the air. And he wished that he could live on into the 20th century so that he could see all these things. Isn't that remarkable? He's elected to the United States Constitutional Convention, which is the point where we started today. He also gets reelected to governor of Pennsylvania at the same time. While there at the Constitutional Convention, he, comes, he helps come up with what we know as the Great Compromise, which ends the debate between large and small states as to how uh, they're going to be represented in Congress. We come up with two houses of Congress His final act, his final public act, is going to be his call to end the practice of slavery in America. He scoffed at the notion that blacks were inferior, believing instead that they were victims of their own environment and a deprived education. In 1787, Franklin established the first abolition society in America, in America and he even became its president. In 1789, he formally asked Congress to pass a resolution ending the practice of slavery in America. When Congress failed to act, Franklin predicted that only a civil war would end that practice. His health begins to fail even during the Constitutional Convention. He had to be carried every day up the steps in a sedan chair because of the gout and the arthritis that he had been afflicted with. And of course, things only worsened from that point. It became very obvious, 1789, that he wouldn't be around much longer. And so his great friend, who he had defended so many times when he was in Congress, George Washington, sends him a final letter. Among other things, that letter said, if to be venerated for benevolence, if to be admired for talents, if to be esteemed for patriotism, if to be beloved for philanthropy can gratify the human mind, you have the pleasing consolation to know that you have not lived in vain. Franklin died a short time later. At his funeral, 20,000 people came out to pay their last respects. Half the population of Philadelphia. But Franklin's life, as I close this, does not end there. In the year of his death, he left trusts of a thousand pounds to the cities of Boston and Philadelphia. A thousand pounds equates to about a hundred thousand dollars in today's money in America. And those trusts, according to his wills, were supposed to last 200 years. For the first hundred years, 
small loans were to be given at 5% interest per annum to married men under 25 years of age who had completed apprenticeships and wanted to start their own businesses. How about this? Two centuries after his death, he's still setting people up in business. Additional funds could also be used for municipal improvements. And so in the first century, hundreds of young men got their start in business from these loans. They were carpenters, <clears throat> bakers, shoemakers, tailors, printers, painters, cabinet makers, canners, clock makers, and even book binders. And many of them went on to become involved in civic affairs just as Franklin had. There was, for example, Liberty Brown, a silversmith who received a $319 loan in 1800. He was soon elected president of Philadelphia City Council. There was Charles Wells, a, brook, a bricklayer who received a $100 loan in 1808. He was elected mayor of Boston in 1831. In spite of mismanagement at times, the trusts continued to grow. From these funds, Boston built Franklin Park, one of the most beautiful in the nation. Boston also founded the Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology in 1906. Andrew Carnegie was so impressed with this institution that he built a library for the school. Go on the internet and see what it's become today. You won't believe your eyes. It's incredible. Philadelphia, with the money from their trust, founded the Franklin Institute. Look that up and see what it's become today. This, at that time, was a school for scientific and technical education, and it still is to this day. Those trusts continued to help many well into the second 200 years of their existence. From 1962 to 1976, loans of $3,476,000 helped 1,749 young people gain an education. In 1990, the trusts, $4.5 million in Boston and $2 million in Philadelphia, expired and the money was turned over to those schools. Franklin devoted his entire life to building a nation and to helping others. To his friends and to his fellow members of the Junto, I'm sure he was often greeted with Franklin, with the exclamation mark that I talked to you about at the very beginning of this presentation. When settlers under attack from Indians on the frontier saw Franklin coming to their rescue with militia, I'm sure he was greeted with an exclamation mark. His enemies in the British Parliament, upon learning of their setbacks during the re Revolution, wrung their hands, I'm sure, and lamented, Franklin, with an exclamation mark. Those in France, upon learning of his arrival, we know gleefully shouted, Franklin. When George Washington needed funding and support from Congress, for his armies, he thanked Franklin, I'm sure, on many occasions with an exclamation mark. Even his actions at the, con at the Constitutional Convention, though he often slept through the sessions, have to be described with an exclamation mark at the end of his name. Without Franklin, where would we, where would we be today? Really, if you want to be impressed, look up those two schools on the internet, and you won't believe what's going on over there. Um, it, it's open, the the uh, one university is open to the public. They have a science museum where children go from the elementary schools with their teachers. People from the community can go in there. The universities, they have flourished. And I'm sure that they wouldn't be what they are today without Franklin's incredible idea of forming these trusts in the two cities he loved the most. Thank you, Steve. If you have a minute and want to fill these evaluation forms out, greatly appreciate it. Just note, these are not to evaluate Steve per se, but the idea of us having a speaker series. Um, you can certainly put comments on there. All positive, I'm sure, about, about Steve. But ideas for maybe future ideas uh, and topics that we could have with um, 
again, maybe Steve talking about or others for future um, speaker series. So thank you. Again, thanks, Steve. Thank and, you for uh, the opportunity. Um, appreciate it. You can just live up here. Thank you. And there's, there's pens if you need a pen. <laughs> No, sorry. That was my chair. Where? Oh, this one? If Katie touched it, then that room. But I'm like Ray. I'm like Ray. Put my picture. Well, I told him, I said, he's put on a Broadway, and then like, my, my president could go see it and be offended. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah, I need that. That's quite a guy. Thank you. Thank you.